Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Community Bible Church. We're so glad that you've decided to worship with us today online. Um, it's hard to believe, but this week is already going to be Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. And uh, sadly, we won't be able to gather physically to celebrate those things, uh, but we're going to do a couple special things. Um, this coming Friday, which is Good Friday, when Jesus Christ was crucified, um, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. Now, we can't do it again physically, but we're going to do it via Zoom technology. Um, Jesus and his disciples observed the Lord's Supper in the upper room. Uh, we're inviting you into the Zoom room, and uh, we'll be sending out the appropriate links for those of you who are part of our church family to uh, join in. But we'd love to have you do that. And this week you can purchase whatever grape juice or crackers or bread that you need to symbolize the body and blood of Christ and bring that into the Zoom room with us, and we will observe that together. Um, now, I had thought that probably this is the first time in church history when churches um, had to meet remotely via video conferencing technology, but um, somebody actually sent me this picture here this week, uh, which suggests maybe this has happened, been happening longer than we thought. Um, somehow I missed this particular story in the Bible, <laughs> but there it is, and uh, we're going to do what we can uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, this Good Friday, and so stay tuned for the appropriate email links for that. And then, of course, uh, this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we've got a couple special things planned for that as well, so please be sure to join us as we worship the Lord online and celebrate the resurrection of Christ this coming Sunday. But today, um, we're going to focus on a passage in Galatians chapter 6, uh, Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Let me just read this to you. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, when it comes to my uh, personal finances and uh, personal investments, um, modest though they may be, I tend to be a pretty conservative kind of guy. Um, mutual funds, index funds, nothing too wild and crazy. But a few years ago, shortly after the Gulf War in Iraq, uh, I ran across an article that caught my eye. It was talking about the fact that the United States was opening up the Iraqi economy for American investments. And it was encouraging people to invest in the Iraqi dinar, which is this right here. It's basically their version of the American dollar. And uh, the rationale behind this article, encouraging people to invest in the Iraqi diner, was, was really threefold. Number one, they said it's really in America's best interest to see uh, the Iraqi economy thrive because the sooner Iraq can become a stable country, uh, the sooner our boys can come home and quit fighting over there in the Middle East. And so it was sort of a patriotic appeal. The message was basically if you invest in the Iraqi economy, you're doing something good for America, right? Um, second, the, the second argument they made is that, well, you know, the, the Iraqi dinar, it's kind of a, a, a pretty little bill. It's a, kind of a novelty to have one of these things. And, and given the historical significance of that war and the, the significance of the times, they said, wouldn't you want to own a piece of history, right? Um, and then third, um, it said that, that once Iraq became stable, um, because it's a very oil-rich country, they said the oil revenues would kick in, the value of the dinar would, would rise, and there'd be some real opportunities to, to make some good money with this investment. And, and, and that is, in fact, what happened, you may recall, with the Kuwaiti dinar um, just a few short years earlier. Uh, before the liberation of Kuwait, the Kuwaiti dinar was worth, worth virtually nothing. Uh, but after the war, its value shot up, and a lot of people made some fair money investing in the Kuwaiti dinar. So that was the same argument with respect to the Iraqi dinar. So... When I read that article, I thought, you know, I'm a pretty patriotic guy. Um, I love my country. I want to do my part to help. Uh, it'd be great to own a little piece of history. And uh, it'd be really great if I could make some money in the process. And so I didn't invest a lot, but I had a few extra dollars at the time. And so I bought just a, a handful of Iraqi diners. And how did that turn out? Well, um, since the Gulf War, as you know, uh, the Iraqi economy has been booming. Uh, if by booming you mean uh, roadside bombs and rocket-propelled grenades and, and constant war and conflict, that's sort of been the story in Iraq. And in actuality, uh, Iraq has continued to struggle and so has its currency. Um, this dinar is essentially worthless. Um, or I should say it was until about three weeks ago. 
because about that time people discovered you could actually use this as toilet paper, right? Which uh, is in very high demand right now, very expensive. And so uh, I'm hanging on to these. Uh, a stack of these babies makes me a very rich man. Um, but, but seriously, that little adventure um, was a good reminder to me that there really are no sure things when it comes to financial investments. And we certainly don't need any reminders of that fact right now. Um, In the midst of this ever-growing pandemic, much of the focus has been on the medical impact of this coronavirus. Uh, But it's also having a significant impact on our economy and on the markets. And in fact, stocks are down over 25% uh, from their record highs in February. Uh, It's really taken a hit. And, And I think that's just a good reminder not to trust in what the Bible calls the uncertainty of riches. It seems that there really is no such thing as a secure investment right now. But what if I were to tell you that there is an investment opportunity that can guarantee you unlimited returns, even in a collapsing global economy like this, that regardless of world events, regardless of market conditions, this investment will just continue to increase in value. But the catch is it's not a financial investment. It's a spiritual one. Um, In fact, your personal financial advisor probably can't help you with this one. This kind of investing will require a very astute spiritual advisor. In fact, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to my very own uh, personal spiritual investment manager. Um, His name is Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, in fact. And uh, let's imagine just for a moment that, that we're stepping into his office to get some advice about our spiritual investments. And I can imagine the conversation might go something like this. Paul's sitting down at his desk across from us, and he, he says, well, what can I do for you this morning? And you say, well, Paul, um, I'd like to make a spiritual investment, and I need some advice. Oh, well, great. What, what do you have to invest, Paul says. Well, uh, God gave me this life, and, and, and included in that is some time and some talents and some treasure, you know, various relationships and resources, all the things that go along with life, and, and, and I'd like to know how I can invest this life of mine. Paul says, well, you're in luck because uh, I've actually written up a prospectus on each of the available funds that you can use to invest your life in, and and it's right here in my epistle to the Galatians. In fact, let's take a look at it together. And he refers us to verses 7 and 8. He says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows or invests, this he will also reap. For the one who sows or invests to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So Paul says there are really um, two places you can invest your life. First, there's what we call the flesh fund. And you say, the flesh fund? Oh, well, that sounds kind of interesting, sounds kind of exciting. I kind of like the sound of that. Paul says, well, it is very exciting, no doubt. Um, um, This fund is a real favorite of of pleasure seekers and thrill seekers everywhere. You say, oh, well, well, that sounds great. Tell me a little bit about this flesh fund. Paul says, well, if you've read some of my other writings... Uh, particularly the book of Romans, then then you know that when I speak about the flesh, I'm referring to to all that we are apart from God, really our our sinful nature, right? And um, if you invest in the flesh, it really means that you're not living for God's glory, you're living for your own glory. You're not investing in the good of other people, you're really just investing in your own selfish interests. And you say to yourself, well, you know, I actually kind of like the sound of that, um, because I kind of like myself. I kind of like pursuing my own selfish pleasures. Tell tell me a little bit more about this fund, Paul. What's what's this flesh fund all about? What what kind of yields, what kind of returns can I expect to uh, receive if I invest in the flesh fund? Paul says, well, this fund yields very consistent returns. Notice with me in verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Paul says, year after year, this fund delivers to its investors a never-ending supply of corruption. And you say, well, well, wait a second, Paul. Uh, I thought you said this this flesh fund was fun. I thought you said it was a favorite of thrill seekers, that there was pleasure to be found in it. And Paul says, oh yes, certainly there is, but but the pleasure is very short-lived. In fact, the moment you invest in this fund, it immediately loses its value. For instance, if you invest in in the selfish pleasures of, of, let's say, adultery or pornography, Um, Those things will promise you pleasure, and they do deliver a a moment of exhilaration, but but only for a moment. Almost immediately, you're overcome by feelings of guilt and shame and emptiness. Or consider the selfish pleasure of greed and envy, right? Uh, Material possessions promise satisfaction, um, and and for a moment they deliver, 
But pretty soon that, that beautiful home or that, that fancy car, you know, they break down and in time you sort of get tired of it. And, and that thing that you thought would give you so much joy ultimately leaves you wanting more. Um, it's precisely what Jesus was talking about when he said that uh, when we accumulate treasures on earth, if the thieves don't get them, the, the moth and the rusts will. Um, investing the flesh inevitably leads nothing but emptiness and corruption. You may say, well, well, Paul, then why on earth are you even telling people about this fund? I mean, why would you recommend it to anybody? Paul says, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not recommending it. I'm just laying out your options here. Well, you say, Paul, do you have any other options, right? Is there something you might actually recommend to me? And Paul says, yes, there is. There's another fund. Um, it's called the Spirit Fund. And, and I've got to tell you, this is my personal favorite, right? I, I love to recommend this one to my clients. But, but I have to tell you this, um, this isn't open to all investors, um, only certain people can invest in this fund. So I need to ask you a few preliminary questions to see if you qualify. Um, first, have you ever come to the point in your life when you realized you were a sinner, you realized that you were worthy of God's condemnation, and you realized that there's nothing you could do to save yourself? Um, and having recognized that, have you ever just thrown yourself on God's mercy, asked him to save you, asked him to forgive you? Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, recognizing that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he rose from the dead to give you new life? Have you ever placed your faith in Christ? And you say, well, Paul, yes, yes, I have. I've, I've repented of my sin, and I've, I've placed my faith in Jesus. He says, well, then great, you qualify to invest in this fund. You say, well, well, good, but, but if the flesh fund yields corruption, Paul, what kind of dividends can I expect from this, this spirit fund? Well, Paul says, the spirit fund operates very differently than the flesh fund. Um, the spirit fund, unlike the flesh fund, it doesn't always give you that immediate buzz, that immediate moment of exhilaration. Uh, in fact, you may not see visible returns right away. But I tell you what, this is a far more stable fund. In fact, if you invest in this fund, not only will it hold its value, when it takes off, it will perpetually increase in value. Its stock will just go up and up and up for all eternity. Just as verse 8 here says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows or invests to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You see, when we place our faith in Jesus, we begin a relationship with him that will never end. And ultimately, we'll spend eternity with Christ in heaven. And while our entrance into heaven is granted purely on the basis of God's grace, through no effort of our own, the degree to which we will enjoy special rewards and responsibilities in heaven will be largely determined by how faithfully we have served Christ in this life. Um, the spiritual investments that we make now will continue to pay dividends, rich dividends, for all eternity. Now you say to yourself, well, Paul, that sounds really good. In fact, if it's so great, why isn't everybody invested in this fund? I mean, it all, frankly, sounds kind of too good to be true. Surely there's some, some catch, some strings attached. Paul says, no, 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 there, there's no strings attached. But I do need to offer caution. As your spiritual investment advisor, I, I did feel that in the interest of full disclosure, um, I needed to include some very important disclaimers in this prospectus. And, and notice one of them right here in verse 9. It says, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now, Again, I need to tell you that the Spirit Fund may not show immediate visible results. Oh, you'll experience the love and the joy and the peace that comes from, from knowing Christ. Um, but along with that, you'll experience hardship, um, tragedy, sometimes even persecution. Um, Jesus promised as much. Uh, there will be times when you'll be called to sacrifice and to serve and to step well outside your comfort zone. And in those seasons, when you see only the difficulties and not the dividends... There will be times when you'll be tempted to cash in the spirit fund and transfer it all over back into the flesh fund. You'll be tempted to trade in long-term yields for short-term gains. So I just need to tell you that this spirit fund is not for short-term investors. It really is for people who have a long-term perspective. But if you'll have the patience to hold on to this fund and make small investments in it every single day, Little by little, in time, you will reap if you do not grow weary. The rewards of heaven will more than make up whatever sacrifices you make on earth. Now, let's step out of the Apostle Paul's imaginary office for just a moment here and return to our 
reg regularly scheduled Sunday morning service. Um, we've engaged in a little bit of sanctified imagination here, but, but I don't think it's too far off from what the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul in this passage here. There really are two ways that we can invest our lives. We can live according to the desires of the flesh and live for our own glory and our own good, or we can live by the power of the Spirit and live for the glory of God and for the good of others. We can invest in the flesh and at the end of life have nothing to show for it but, but corruption and emptiness, or we can walk in the Spirit of Christ and enjoy His presence and His rewards for all eternity. You may say, well, Brent, that sounds good. But, but sowing to the Spirit, um, laying up treasure in heaven, those are nice phrases, but, but what exactly do they mean? How exactly do we do that? What does it look like in everyday life on planet Earth? Well, gratefully for us, Paul makes it real simple for us here. In fact, he sums it up in two words. Do good. Notice again Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The way that we sow to the Spirit, the way that we lay up treasure in heaven, is this. We, we do good. Every time we do good to another person, we're, we're investing in the Spirit Fund. We're laying up treasure in heaven. And Paul provided just a little bit more explanation, just a couple verses earlier in Galatians 6, 2, where he said this, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? Well, essentially, it's the law of love. You may recall in Matthew chapter 22, when a lawyer came to Jesus and asked him this question, he said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And you remember how Jesus answered that question. He said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is likened to it. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. Um, Jesus said that, that the whole of, of, of the Christian life can be summed up in these two commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we're no longer under the Mosaic law, but we are still under this law of Christ, and it is a command. It's not optional. Jesus says, this is what your life is now to be about. It's about loving me and loving others. And, and, and 1 John 4.19 shows us the relationship between those things. It says, we love because he first loved us. It is because God so richly bestowed his love on us that, that we love him and we love others. We who have re received God's grace now have the privilege of, of reflecting that grace out into the world and blessing others. We who have experienced God's goodness in our lives in so many ways, we now seek to do good in the lives of others. And this is what Paul means in verse 2 when he says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. As followers of Jesus, no longer are we concerned only about our own comfort, our own safety, our own well-being, our own burdens. No, now he says we gladly bear the burdens of others. We come alongside people and say, hey, how can I meet your need? And it really is a radical way of, of approaching life. Every day we wake up and, and every person we encounter, we say, listen, how can I do good to this person? What needs do they have? What burdens do they carry? And, and how can I help meet that need? How can I help carry that burden? And sometimes those needs will be spiritual. Uh, we may encounter people who don't yet know Christ and it'll be our privilege to share the gospel with them and point them to Jesus. Um, sometimes those needs will be emotional. We'll meet people who are perhaps discouraged or lonely or afraid, and, and we'll be able to encourage them and befriend them. Uh, those needs may be material or physical in, in nature. Uh, we might encounter people with, with health issues or financial issues, and we'll be able to come alongside them and provide tangible, very practical assistance in their lives. But Paul says in verse 10, while we have opportunity, do good. While we have opportunity. I think Paul's alluding to the fact that our time on earth is very short. We have a, a very limited window of opportunity during which we can show people the love of Jesus and invest in their lives, and in so doing, invest in our own eternity, laying up treasure in heaven. Um, and during this brief time on earth, I think sometimes God gives us even, even narrower windows of opportunity when, when there are special seasons when we can do good in the lives of people. And I think we find ourselves in one of those right now. You think about it. Several weeks ago, we'd heard about this kind of weird virus that was over in, in China, we didn't think much of it. Then we heard reports of it popping up here in America. Um, and, and today, probably most of us know someone who has the coronavirus. 
Um, sadly, in the coming days and weeks, most of us will probably know somebody who's died from this virus. Um, already we know people who have been furloughed and who've gotten pay cuts and who are hurting financially because of this. And um, if the experts are right, um, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. And, and we live in a world that is, is really hurting right now, a world of, of people who are desperately in need of help and of hope. And, and the question is this, what are we as God's people going to do, right? Are we going to view these, these shelter-in-place orders as opportunities? Well, I can finally clean the garage and watch some TV. Or are we going to say, no, we're not just going to hunker down. We're going to reach out. And yes, we'll honor all the guidelines when it comes to social distancing and all those things. Those were important. That in and of itself is a way that we love our neighbor by, by keeping our distance. But within those guidelines, are we going to look for opportunities to be as, as aggressive and proactive and as creative as possible to do good? to look for opportunities to meet people's needs and, and to bear their burdens. Paul says, do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so there's a priority here. Uh, Paul says the first priority in terms of doing good is, is the household of faith. That's our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our church family, right? And, and in the days ahead, uh, there will be needs within our church family, and we need to be ready to meet those needs. We need to be sure that we're caring well for each other, communicating and connecting well with each other. And there's some very practical things that, that we can do, that you can do um, to, to enable that. Um, if you haven't already done so, join our email list. That's the primary way that we're going to connect with people and, and uh, share prayer and care needs with each other. Um, join a home team. Um, those small groups in our church really are the best way that we can kind of keep tabs on each other in a healthy way, just making sure we're cared for and prayed for. Um, join our care team. Our care ministry, um, in the days ahead, there will be people who are at risk and vulnerable who will not be able to leave their homes um, at all, and they may need somebody to mow a lawn or do some shopping for them or bring them a meal, and uh, I would love to have just a, a big, long list of people just sort of waiting in the rings, wings, ready to step up and meet those needs when they, when they become available. Um, give to our benevolence fund. Um, again, there's going to be members of our church family that are hurting financially, and we want to be in a position to help as we're able to do that. So um, these are all things that we can do in the days ahead to care for each other and, and to pray for each other well. Um, and, and gratefully, we have a history of doing this well. When, when hurricanes strike, when crises strike, this has been a church that really has rallied around each other well and cared for each other well. And so I'm grateful for that, and I'm confident we can do that in the days ahead. But we not only need to be concerned about each other as a church family, uh, we also need to be concerned about the community and the world around us. Paul says, let us do good to all people. Now, while it might be physically impossible to do good to all people, we, we can do good to the people that God has placed right in front of us. Um, several years ago, an article appeared in Time magazine about a doctor who lived through the terrible bombing in Hiroshima. When the blast occurred, Dr. Fumio Shigeto was waiting for a streetcar only a mile away but he was sheltered by the corner of a concrete building. Within seconds after the explosion, his ears were filled with the screams of victims all around him. Not knowing what had happened, he stood there for a moment, bewildered. One doctor, wondering how he could ever handle this mountain of patience. Then, still somewhat stunned, Dr. Shigeto knelt, opened his black bag, and began treating the person lying at his feet. Um, we can't care for everybody but we can care for the people that God has placed right at our doorstep. And I love what Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon uh, have said in, in their excellent little book, The Art of Neighboring. Uh, let me just read you a section of this. What if the solution to our society's biggest issues has been right under our noses for the past 2,000 years? When Jesus was asked to reduce everything in the Bible into one command, he said, love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. What if he meant that we should love our actual neighbors? You know, the people who live right next door. The problem is that we have turned this simple idea into a nice saying. We put it on bumper stickers and t-shirts and go on with our lives without actually putting it into practice. But the fact is, Jesus has given us a practical plan that we can actually put into practice. A plan that has the potential to change the world. The reality is, though, that the majority of Christians don't even know the names of most of their neighbors. And sadly, sometimes that's true. But listen, we've got an opportunity to change that. Um, I don't know about your neighborhood, but, but my neighborhood has been just a, a flurry of outdoor activity the last few days. 
I've seen more people out and about than ever before. And let's be part of that, right? Get out there. Let's, let's ride our bikes and walk our dogs and stand on the front lawn and, and strike up a conversation with your next door neighbor. If he looks a little distressed or beside himself, maybe offer to share some of your toilet paper with him, right? Be proactive. Um, if there's an elderly neighbor in your neighborhood, um, call them. See how they're doing. See if they can they need any help with a, maybe mowing a lawn, getting some groceries, um, put a note on their door if you don't know their number, but, but look for opportunities to connect with people. Join your neighborhood Facebook group. Join next door. Stay up to date with what the needs in your neighborhood are through that. Um, shop for others while you shop for yourself. There's a lot of local charities and, and organizations like uh, Lunches of Love and the Second Mile Mission that are collecting food for the needy, and, and they need our help in these, in these times. Um, support your local businesses. There's a lot of small business owners and restaurants that are really hurting right now, and, and we can help them by, by, by patronizing their businesses. Um, check in on your local hairstylist or barber or some of these companies that have just been shut down during this time and are really hurting. Just say, hey, how can we pray for you? How are you doing? Um, say thank you to a healthcare professional, right? Um, write them a note. Give them a gift card. Just express your thanks for the good work that they're doing right now. Um, look for ways to invite people who are not part of a church to, to join us online on Sunday mornings like we're doing right now. This Saturday, we as a church have a unique opportunity to serve our community through the Obadiah Project. Um, that's our ministry whereby we provide food for needy families in our community. And uh, it's going to look a little different this time. Uh, nobody will be coming into the building. It'll be a drive through effort. People will pop their trunk. We'll put food in the trunk. Uh, we'll all be wearing masks and gloves maintaining proper social distancing. Um, but there's a lot of people in our community that, that, that depend on that food, and we have an opportunity to serve them. We'd invite you to be part of that. But, but if you're not comfortable with that uh, or with any of these ideas, um, the question is, what are you going to do, right? Are we in this season, are we going to sow to the flesh or sow to the spirit, right? Are we going to invest only in ourselves and our own comfort and our own well-being, or are we going to reach out and, and do good to all people? That's what God calls us to do in this season. Many years ago, the farmers in China theorized that they could eat their big potatoes and keep their small potatoes for seed. So that's what they did. They ate all the big potatoes and they planted all the small potatoes. And as a result of doing that over the years, what they discovered is that nature had reduced all of their potatoes to the size of marbles. Uh, they learned the hard way that you can't have the best things in life for yourself and, and just use the leftovers for seed. No, you really will reap what you sow. And what's true in the agricultural realm is equally true as we've seen today in the spiritual realm. And my prayer for us is that in the days ahead that we would be people who, who aren't content to, to plant small potatoes, right? That we wouldn't just uh, tend to our own needs and our own comfort, but that we would instead reach out sacrificially, generously to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. So that on the other side of this pandemic, when this crisis passes, We'll be able to look back and reap a harvest of souls, people that have given their lives to Jesus, because while we had opportunity, we did good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have been so good to us, and may we, as a response out of the expression of a grateful heart, may we reach out to others to do good for them so that they can experience the love of Christ through us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.